just briefly about the outline of my talk. So first of all, I would like to understand who of you is working with neuroimaging data, or has ever worked with neuroimaging data. Where did somebody? Everybody else in computational neuroscience? Kind of like, more on the computational side? Yep, okay, good. Um, just, okay, so basically outline of my talk, I will give you a, at the beginning, the first step that you made, the introduction to a very short introduction into neuroimaging, what we can do and what we cannot do with neuroimaging. And then uh, in the second part of my talk, I will focus on two specific examples. One example from neurology, and one example from psychiatry, namely Alzheimer's disease and autism spectrum disorder. And I will present you um, first some work of uh, many colleagues uh, or researchers in the world on how we can use neuroimaging to advance our understanding of the Alzheimer's disease. And then in the last part of my talk, I will present you our recent work on how we can improve understanding of autism spectrum disorder using these technologies. So let me first start from a kind of a biology point of view. Where we are with neuroimaging and where we are not with neuroimaging. So basically, um, I've just very kind of like general express um, pathways. So basically what we measure, what we always tend to forget is that the neuroimaging, when we talk about uh, brain structure and function, we are actually here on the pathway of from starting from genes. The genes have to be tra transcribed into specific tissue types. So those tissue types form or those proteins for uh, different cell types, like neurons, glial cells, and so on. And that basically gives us a kind of like, for example, in that case, brain tissue, and only here, we get some kind of like image contrasts, either with electrophysiology, where we can measure electrical activity, or with uh, MRI, where we can measure some properties of the tissue. And last but not least, of course, the emerging property of the brain is the behavior. So basically, ultimately, whatever we do with neuroimaging, and in terms of disease pathology, we want to link it either to the behavioral side, or to the gene side, or the gene expression, or to the underlying tissue, basically to start to understand how those emerging properties of the brain relate to underlying neuropathology or how they, they relate to the behavior observed in the specific patient populations. Um, that is a very, like, fairly old slide from neuroimaging, which is actually kind of illustrative of what kind of, like, limitations we deal with when selecting specific neuroimaging methodologies. Today we heard a lot about resting state of MRI, but actually we have a lot, of course, of many more methodological aspects where we can classify our, our choice of neuroimage methodology. For example, this is one of the common scales used where the uh, Greenwald and Hildesheim, they plotted a while ago different methodologies based on the x-axis, for example, based on the time resolution they provide. So basically, if you can measure milliseconds, if you can measure minutes, hours, days, and so on, or if you can measure what is the spatial resolution we're going to. Basically, are we talking about macro scales, micro scales, and so on? And those imaging technologies basically can also, of course, be classified based on any other possible dimensions. Importantly, what we basically mostly use in human neuroimaging, in particular about clinical neuroimaging, what I'm going to talk about today, it's about this part of the scale. So basically, typically, we are razor slow and razor low resolution. In human imaging, except basically, for example, EEG, MEG, which gives us a really good temporal resolution, uh, we are at the cost of lower spatial resolution. In contrast, with MRI or with PET, we get a fairly uh, coarse resolution of millimeters. Basically, we talk about the uh, uh, best possible, basically, for example, with a high, ultra high field uh, MRI, we start to go into a sub millimeter resolution, but it's still far, far away from microscopy. And this is, uh, these are the limitations we need to consider when choosing our kind of tools for our experiments in clinical settings. Another way of classifying, which will be important for my talk today, is to, uh, to classify these technologies in a slightly different way from a clinical perspective. So of course, most of you are aware that they can measure brain structure, as for example, uh, <coughs> nicely illustrated in the first talk by Maritza Corvetta, where we can uh, differentiate between gray meta, white meta structures, and so on. Uh, but what most of you probably don't know is that MRI, for example, also provides a lot of other modalities. We can not only measure kind of, kind of gray versus white matter structure, but there are novel techniques which can provide us a kind of quantification of myelin, so how much myelin is in a specific voxel in the brain, or uh, what is the iron concentration of a specific region. And 
iron concentrations, for example, known uh, to accumulate Parkinson's disease and several other neurodegenerative disorders, and so we can apply those tools. Of course, from, we can also go away from structure, we can go into brain activity. Again, I will not go too much into detail into that. Rest, you heard a lot about usage of, for example, resting state today. Of course, we can also apply tasks. We give participants tasks and we measure which regions are particularly active in one task as compared to a control condition or do a similar type of resting state or task-based experiments using electroencephalography or MEG or magnetic encephalography. Um, but last but not least, another important category which has emerged quite a while ago but has been quite advanced, um, particularly in the last decade, I would say, or in the last two, one to two decades, is the so-called neuropathology imaging. And neuropathology imaging is like, for example, nicely the best illustrated in the concept of Alzheimer's disease. Uh, those of you who have a bit of background in terms of understanding who had some courses in clinical neuroscience, know that Alzheimer's disease is characterized by primarily in terms of histopathology by presence of so-called so amyloid plaques in the brain and so-called tau fibril tangle. So basically there are two kinds of misfolded protein structures which emerge in the tissue of the brain. Uh, of Alzheimer's disease patients, and which is typically visualized post-mortem. So the person has first to die, then the brain is dissected, then through specific staining, we can make those type of uh, accumulation of these abnormal proteins visible. But the recent advances in PET, the development of novel PET traces now allow us to visualize any kind of those, uh, neuropathology. So we can create an individual scan of the amyloid pathology in the brain or of the tau pathology in those brains. And of course, this can be extended to other different pathologies, and there are still major advances going on in that field. So, important also, we have not only each, uh, to consider that each modality is on itself, it has its advantages, its disadvantages, <laughs> but of course, we can go on and combine these different modalities. We, we can basically say, okay, what can give, uh, this modality give us as compared to another modality? For example, we can get this temporal resolution of EEG, the spatial resolution of fMRI. But uh, also in the, in the first talk, we can use DTI, that's basically tractography of the brain, to understand how the fibers are located and to make more informed decisions in, about our underlying pathology. Importantly, also for my talk, I need to introduce you some kind of more conceptual terms. So, called, for example, when we talk about connectivity, we talk, for example, about structural connectivity, functional connectivity, or effective connectivity, and let me just illustrate what it, for example, means from a functional connectivity point of view. So basically, for example, we acquire in the brain of a specific participant or a patient a series of scans, a series of scans, which measure the consumption of oxygen in the re specific region over time. So basically, we put the patient into the scanner, we measure for 10 minutes, let's say, and we get, for example, for each specific voxel, now very placative, just a sinusoidal, a sinusoidal function, a kind of time activity curve. Then we can extract the same type of activity over the time from any other voxel in the brain and can compute a cross correlation between the two. And then we see basically, okay, that voxel, for example, is stronger correlated with this initial voxel as compared to this one. So we get a kind of weighting of connectivities. We can, for example, simply count the number of correlations going through a specific voxel. Then we end up with so called degree centrality metric. Degree centrality is basically if you have a high degree centrality. It means that the voxel is highly connected to a lot of other voxels in the brain. So basically a lot of strong correlations going through that voxel. If it's low degree centrality, it means that there are low number of <coughs> strong correlations in with that voxel to the rest of the brain. So synchronized versus desynchronized concepts. Uh, we can go further and we can convert these cor correlations into different distance metrics. For example, one minus R. If it's a structure correlation coefficient, that's what we will see. Or one minus, then basically the higher the correlation, the closer the two voxels are together, the lower the correlation, the further they are apart. Just simple distance metrics, again, that can be, become as complex as you want, but it's just basically to illustrate, it's just we convert a similarity into a distance metric. And also the last point which is important to understand is the so-called covariance. Covariance is more static. So for example, when we call, uh, talk about structural co covariance, it means, for example, let's assume we have two regions, hypocampus and amygdala. So if we know that the hippocampus in a specific structure or a specific subject is large, and we see that the amygdala is also large in that subject, and another subject where the amygdala is looks small, and we see also that the hippocampus is small, we know that these two structures kind of co-ride co together. So if one is up, 
then we are, have a likely, high likelihood that the other is also going up. That will be, for example, a strong structural covariance across subjects between two different regions. So that's basically a kind of static concept. And it basically illustrates a kind of like assumption, things which are grown together belong together. Good? So far clear? Okay, so now, the, again, that's my last introduction slide. Now what we can do with those technologies, basically kind of like more general overview. Um, in neuroimaging, in clinical neuroscience, we have now to decide not only about the tool we want to use, but also on the question we want to answer. For example, <coughs> do we want to understand disease progression, disease detection? Do we want to detect the disease as early as possible, as accurate as possible? Do we want to predict specific symptoms or Further away, basically, do we want, for example, to say anything about a specific drug or about a specific treatment, how it impacts the brain, or about if somebody is going to respond or not to respond to a specific treatment? So these are, in general, the kind of clinical neuroscience questions. And my further two examples will basically focus on kind of subdomains of those type of applications. So questions so far? Good. No? OK, good. So let's now, for example, uh, in an illustrative example of several different studies published in the last five years, uh, to illustrate on what can neuroimaging tell us about uh, Alzheimer's disease and other neurodegenerative disorders. In particular, the, the question is here about what can neuroimaging tell us? Because we know that we can wait till a patient dies, we can look into the brain of that patient, and we can still uh, see this pathology. So we can get this information also at some point, but what can actually specifically in vivo neuroimaging tell us what we cannot reach from any other in vivo or ex vivo modality or any kind of like animal experiments, let's say. So um, to, give, to start with that, I need to give you a brief introduction into Alzheimer's disease. And Alzheimer's disease and uh, this knowledge, what I show here, most of this knowledge was generated without any involvement of neuroimaging. So for example, we now, uh, Alzheimer's disease, I've mentioned already, we have the so-called uh, tau pathology and amyloid flux pathology. Basically, these two types of misfolded proteins, which accumulate in different structures. But what we know from those kind of ex vivo experiments by Brack and many others, uh, that those pathologies don't just randomly accumulate across the whole brain, but more that they start in very specific structures, very distinct structures of the brain. For example, we know that tau accumulation uh, starts qu quite strongly in the uh, hippocampal region. And then basically, you see here these arrows, these kind of gradients. So, at later disease stages, this tau pathology propagates into a new brain region and starts to accumulate there. And then the disease becomes more and more progressive. Mm -hmm. Same is also true for, Alzheimer, for amyloid pathology. We know that the amyloid pathology is high in, for example, frontoparietal regions at some point, and then it accumulates proportionately high in the specific regions as compared to other regions. Similar is actually exactly the same type of pattern, spatial patterns are observed in various other neurodegenerative diseases. So the question now arises, why the spatial structure? So is there any explanation for that? Is there any possible, possible uh, uh, method to test that? So that's basically one part of the puzzle we need to solve. And the second part of the puzzle is also, we know that there are a lot of, for example, for Alzheimer's disease in the past 30 years, I would say 30, 40 years, a lot of biomarkers have been generated which show abnormality in Alzheimer's disease. <laughs> So we know that, again, tau is increased, amyloid is increased. But we also know that there is a lot of atrophy going on in those brains. We know that, for example, the activity, brain activity, as measured using uh, glucose PET, the G-PET, uh, is also decreased in those brain regions uh, across participants. And of course, the clinical symptoms themselves start to emerge, and they probably, like, for example, first they get memory deficits uh, occur, then other more complex cognitive functions start to get impaired. So, OK, we know from post-mortem studies from cross-sectional studies, how those tankers approximately look like. But we actually don't really know what of the, which of those events here, or the combination of these events here, of those modalities, actually cause the symptoms. So is it the amyloid? Is it the tau? Is it the glucose? Is it the atrophy? Is it something else, potentially? So we need to understand this kind of like causality of events. And so Basically, these are the two types of questions I would basically try to address in the next few slides with some kind of recent publications on the topic. So let's first ask ourselves, so, so basically these atrophy patterns. I showed you that there is a distinct spatial structure of how atrophy progresses in the brains of 
participants. So Alzheimer's disease is primarily hippocampus, and then it spreads from the hippocampus into temporal regions, into the parietal regions, and then some, at some point it starts also to affect the frontal cortex. And so in this very elegant study by uh, Helen Zhuan Zhu, uh, in 2012 already, so a few years ago, published in Neuron, they did a very elegant approach. So they took um, a lot of quite large public data of, or basically they collected in um, UCSD, I think at that time, from different neurodegenerative diseases, Alzheimer's disease, frontotemporal dementia, semantic dementia, and progressive non-fluent aphasia, or corticobasal syndrome. So they're basically <coughs> kind of like nomenclature for different neurodegenerative diseases with different underlying pathology and different clinical symptoms. And what they said, okay, let's quantify the atrophy. So basically which regions are primarily affected in terms of atrophy and Alzheimer's disease. So we see here, these are those hot spots that are defined. So basically this is region which is in that cohort of Alzheimer's disease patients, which they have, is most strongly affected with respect to atrophy, for example. That is the spot here, you, you barely see it, uh, but basically it's kind of orange dots here. This has the hot spots which are basically kind of representative for the most affected atrophy region in this other <coughs> neurodegenerative diseases. And so basically what they said, okay, now, let's go into a healthy control population. Let's go far before Alzheimer's actually occurs. And let's compute the so-called functional connectivity, which I've introduced to you before. Basically, the kind of cross-correlation between different regions, just of the time series, as collected using resting state. And now, let's define some kind of computational metrics, which can uh, allow us different types of interpretations. So, for example, they computed the so-called total flow. So, basically, they just counted the sum of magnitude of weighted connections passing through each node. So they just summed up all the correlations, and the correlations were weighted depending on if the node is connected to another important node or not important node and so on. They also um, computed basically for each kind of node the shortest intrinsic functional paths to these epicenters. So basically those epicenters here, so we have we extract now in health controls a resting state signal in those regions or time series. And now compute for each other voxel in the brain or each other region in the brain, how strongly is it correlated to the region, and so, and how many basically nodes we need to go to get from here to this epicenter. So, for example, from here, the shortest path needs to be you, so basically, if you compute the kind of distance again, one minus r. In that case, we can go from that region to that region, from to that region, then we go to the epicenter. So that basically, this distance here is a kind of now illustration for us the shortest path we can go from one node to another node. Another why also what they also evaluated is is it potentially a kind of clustering coefficient, the ratio of number of edges between the node's neighbor and the total possible number of edges. So basically, kind of like how embedded is the node into its environment. So how central it is, but also how much basically how much how many other regions cluster around that node. And they evaluate it now when basically what happens if we compute it with the different epicenters. And now Again, so basically what uh, is important to see here is also again, they put this epicenters of atrophy, but of course they have also the atrophy metric for any other region in the brain for those diseases. So basically we can now create a kind of spatial gradients of, of those atrophy measurements. So for example, that region has a lot of atrophy, most atrophy, another region has less, another region has even more uh, less atrophy. And so this atrophy can be expressed as a kind of T-score per region. So every single dot here is a specific region, and that's the amount of atrophy in the respective disease, ultimately, or basically in this respective uh, disease population, that neurodegenerative disease, and that's plotted on the y-axis. And now we plot basically for the different diseases, as I've illustrated here before, Alzheimer's, behavior, frontal dementia pattern, semantic dementia, progressive non fluid aphasia, and so on. What actually is uh, this atrophy in disease population is correlated with in a healthy population. And what we see here, for example, total flow, so basically, again, the amount of all correlation between that region and any other region in the brain. We see there are some kind of correlations. They are like explain 1% of parents, 8% of parents, 9% of parents, 7% of parents, so, so on. So decent, some of them may be even significant, some not. Uh, they actually um, not important. They also see where they have the clustering coefficients, similar magnitude between 0 and 14%. It's explained depending on the disease. But now, when we look on the shortest path to the epicenter, so basically, if a voxel is highly correlated to time series with this epicenter, they mean basically if it's kind of connected or low connected to this epicenter, and we see 
that the lowest correlation actually is the lowest amount of variance is seven percent, and it goes up to forty five percent of explained variance. So this disease is how many patients? Or this were cohorts roughly of fifty, sixty to hundred patients, depending okay. on basically on the, uh, depending on the uh, dimension group, but it were all reasonably large groups. And basically, so if we now compute the shortest path to the epicenter in health, again, health of individuals, every region is, every dot is basically a kind of connection. So how, how for example, here, this 0.6 would illustrate that that voxel here, or that region here, is to cor correlated to 0.6 with mm -hmm. our epicenter we defined in that cohort. And we see here that there is a nice kind of correlation emerging across all neurodegenerative diseases, some less, some more. But still, it seems to be that the shortest path to the epicenter, so the basically it is a stronger a region is functionally connected in a healthy brain to our epicenter, the more likely it's going to be affected by the atrophy. So basically, and the, basically the conclusion of that study was that the functional, what functionally belongs together, or what functionally goes together, also dies together. <laughs> so basically, kind of it's an essential illustration. If I have a region A, at that region, it propagates a time series. And I know that another region is functionally strongly dependent on that region. It means that if that region is, or now my region A is going to be affected, then my region B has the highest probability to disappear first after that region. Because, potentially, because it loses its uh, input from that region, but also another possibility is because uh, uh, what has been shown now since then is that a lot of these misfolded proteins kind of propagate like a prime means that they can translate from the synapses to another region, and that basically that other regions get kind of infected by that initial region. That message? Oops. Just to put emphasis. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. No, but look, you, you could also argue that if this is functional connectivity measures, right? Yeah. So you could also say, well, it means that there is some sort of desynchronization in the activity. It's not necessarily that it's not there, structurally. It's just that the, the initial the correlations in activity patterns that might have existed before, mm -hmm. let's say in the resting state, that those correlated patterns of activity have been changed. That's true. But keep in mind that those here are from healthy. From, yeah, from ah, OK, people. you have a reference. So basically, we have a reference. Basically, we take people who are not yet affected by that disease. And we compute okay. the correlation from those people <coughs> and then link it to something which may occur or may not occur in 20, 30 years. Mm -hmm. And okay. still, we get those nice correlations. All right, got it. OK, good. So let's move forward. What, what is the next question? So again, since recently, tau, for example, has only been, been developed, like really good tau traces have been developed within the last five, six, seven, eight, eight years. So since then, we basically, for example, know or we can visualize. So how does the amyloid deviation in Alzheimer's relative to controls look like? So which regions accumulate amyloid? Which region are, for example, primarily affected by hypometabolism? So basically, where its function is mostly reduced. So the regions which consume less, ox uh, less glucose in that case means that these regions are more impaired in terms of the brain activity. Or where is the, is the tau load in Alzheimer's disease patients relative to controls? And now. Um, because we know that the brain activity is a kind of a very important measurement. So the more active the brain, usually the better the subjects perform. Is which one of the two is actually driving the glucose utilization reductions? And that study from Bishop et al. from 2016, they basically created those spatial maps. And what they did is a very simple spatial correlation. So they plotted now the tau deviation versus glucose utilization deviation versus amyloid deviation. And what they see is, for example, that if we now first let's start with that one, if we correlate the metabolism, hypometabolism, so the higher the score, the more hypometabolic the region is, the more affected the region is, versus amyloid deposition. And so basically, the more amyloid, the worse. Not much what we would consider. But what we see is actually means there is a significant correlation, but that correlation is actually really negative. It means that the more, uh, so basically, the more amyloid we have, actually, uh, the, the less. Uh, or the more uh, so, so the more amyloid they have, the less metabolism those regions have, and the more uh, the less amyloid they have, the more affected are those regions in terms of hypermetabolism. Surprising, completely contradictory, but this answer question that was never clear because all the animal experiments to date pointed that amyloid and tau are kind of both very toxic, both lead to neural death. But here is, the studies actually show 
Actually, if this correlation is there, it's really negative. And there are a few other studies which actually didn't find the correlation, but they didn't find any correlation between the two, showing basically that if this dependency is there, this dependency is not straightforward, not as one would expect it, and not interpretational. However, if we look now on the hypermetabolism and tau depositions, we see a very striking positive correlation. What exactly what we would like to see, meaning the more tau a specific region accumulates, the more the activity in that region goes down. So again, so suggesting basically that in this case, there is a very clear answer uh, that tau seems to be the main driver of glucose utilization reductions. It means that the more tau you have, the more you functionally impaired the specific region. Mm -hmm. They also tried to characterize kind of interaction, and they were even indeed able to show that there is a kind of like negative and positive effect of amyloid in tau, but the primary conclusion was definitely that the more tau in the specific region, the more impaired the specific region is. Now, again, same similar type of question. Okay, now we know the time tau, uh, tau is driving glucose hypermetabolism, but how does actually tau spread across networks? And here, I will not explain it too much into detail because it's the same uh, similar type of approach as provided by Drew et al. for the atrophy metric. So basically, why they use healthy control network versus um, participants. Here, they use the same type of networks actually in that population. So here they extract the resting state in that population. They have collected for all these different groups of controls, which do not have amyloid, controls which have amyloid, mild cognitive impairment, which is a pre stage of Alzheimer's disease, and Alzheimer's disease itself. So basically, you see how the tau load is increasing. So basically, you have very little tau in controls, abnormal tau, and you have very quite a lot of significant tau load in Alzheimer's disease patients. And now we take resting state data from the same population and compute the kind of like between and with the network connectivity for those regions and see if you can explain any kind of propagation about how tau does tau spread. And indeed, this kind of correlation work quite striking in that study that they, uh, Franz Mayer had done in 2019 brain. What they basically showed is that the more functionally connected those regions are, they said just two different ways of illustrating this kind of like the one is a tau covariance what I was referring to if two regions have if one region has a lot of tau the other region has also a lot of tau and one is directly between the tau load and functional connectivity and in both cases we see a striking association between the more tau you have in a specific region the or actually the, the stronger the functional let me rephrase it the stronger the functional connectivity between two regions is the more likely is it that these two regions have also a high tau load. So basically, if you think a region has high tau load, you compute which region has most functional connectivity to it. And by that, you can predict if this other region has also a high likelihood to be affected by tau or not. So again, a very similar type of message as provided for atrophy, meaning that the regions which are functionally connected also go together in terms of propagation of their neuropathology. So, I have one question. Yes. And one, one thing that when you see this type of analysis very frequently, mm -hmm. and you see that the, the well connected areas are the ones with tau, but then you don't really look at the other well connected areas and show that there is no tau because your dependence isn't that Actually, way inclined in your, in your analysis. Um, no, there are other well connected areas, but for example, mm -hmm. you, for example let's take um, maybe an illustration of that example. Now, what, what they show is basically the kind of analysis is, for example, if you take, one takes that region, which has a lot of tau, and then compute what is correlated with it, and for example, find that that region is strongly correlated, then the likelihood that that region has also a lot of tau is very high. But what, what they do as a control analysis also, they take, for example, regions with low tau, which I don't show it here in my slides, right. and correlate the connectivity between low tau to low tau. And, uh, what, you, what you basically say is also uh, kind of true. So even if this region which have high connectivity to a region which has no tau, they are also more likely to have no tau. So basically it's a kind of like, it's a double. So basically, if, so it's, again, it does, it's kind of like one is derived from the other, but basically it tells you that um, if something is disconnected to that network and forms another independent network, where the nodes are strongly connected to each other, that that network is less likely to be affected quite early in the disease. And only when the other network is completely filled kind of like this tau pathology, then this pathology is going to spread to another network, which is maybe low correlated. So basically the pathology never spread, the spread never stops. At some point it will cover the whole brain.
but the spatial pattern, how it spread, it's pretty highly driven by the initial connectivity of the two regions. But now if we talk about spreading, yeah. then you should see also very distinct temporal change. Yes. Right? So, so can you, are you going to show that to us? Uh, temporal in what sense? Well, over weeks or months or years, you should see that this tau load really follows that network structure. Uh, kind of, uh, yes, sir. I will show one study, which is actually the only longitudinal tau study so far published. Okay, actually, because tau is fairly recent data, the studies just start to be collected. ACNI, for example, now collects tau, but the longest observational periods for this tau to trace, which I'm aware of, uh, one to two years. So. Right. It's fair, still fairly to show. Mm -hmm. So studies which are really prodromal patients mm -hmm. taking and observing how tau spread, I guess the real first longitudinal studies which cover five to ten years will only can come out in the next five to ten years or okay. mm -hmm. so. But that is actually the only longitudinal study which had, which has been published in 2007. Maybe there is one more. But actually with this study they tried to basically to address that kind of question. So they measured the patients twice in a longitudinal setting. So again, here they were basically trying to address the question now because we know that tau is driving the glucose hyperactivity. Uh, hyper so basically, the, the more tau, the more affected this functional region is. But is it actually necessary to induce symptoms or not? So basically, can tau by itself explain differences in performance, or do we need the glucose hypermetabolism as well? Does it predict better the clinical outcome as compared to tau alone? So what they, what they did in that study here by Kiotis et al. in 2017 in molecular psychiatry is, again, they measured a cohort of Alzheimer's disease patients. A longitudinally, uh, longitudinally means like there were, uh, it was a variable time interval, but on average they were one year apart between the two scans. And they measured tau twice, and they measured glucose utilization twice in those patients, and also looked on how the changes in clinical symptoms on clinical, and clinical scales. And what when you plot, when one now plots the tau, Kind of accumulation in this kind of regions of high tau load against the clinical symptom severity. There were some correlations depending on which regions they were plotting, but those correlations, some of them were even significant, but they were not particularly strong. So, so they were 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0 0.5, and it, it was more basically one that went, and there is another study, cross sectional study, which covered tau in the kind of controls, MCI, Alzheimer's disease. So basically, if you stretch the whole clinical staging, then this correlation becomes stronger, but if one talks, only talks about short periods of time, these correlations are kind of like maybe putative, maybe a kind of negative correlation, but that was not significant here. However, when we look on glucose utilization here in uh, this mean, uh, temporal regions, basically here this connected means that these two scan uh, points come from the same subject, uh, from longitudinal data, and plot those um, data now with glucose against symptom severity, we see a fairly striking correlation in terms of like the more glucose uh, metabolism is uh, intact actually here, basically the higher, the better, the less clinical <coughs> symptoms they have, actually for mini mental state scores, for those of you who are not familiar with clinical scales, 30 is the maximum score, so basically 30 means 30 to 27 to 30, you are raised healthy, and then as soon as you start getting dementia, you go down, down, down the scale, basically the less, the worse. And then we see exactly what we would expect. A very striking positive correlation, meaning that the more impaired the function of the region is, the less, uh, the more symptoms the subjects have. So, and that study was basically kind of like putting a missing piece of uh, into the puzzle, showing basically that it actually is primarily the changes in the course utilization that are, were, which are the better predictor of clinical progression as compared to the tau levels. Now, let me kind of summarize that. So I hope I could illustrate you in this kind of series of studies, which were all published very recently using this methodology, that, for example, we can pretty much say that higher connectedness in terms of resting state, functional MRI, uh, so basically regions which belong together, are more susceptible to any specific neurodegenerative disease, at least from these five which were studied in those studies. And then basically we can even go further using this kind of technologies in combination of those technologies, we can now build a kind of chain of events. We can show basically that amyloid, or so we know from actually, I didn't show those studies, from clinical studies that amyloid is one which appears more or less first, that's abnormal. That this amyloid is actually not doesn't predict in clinical development, nor does it predict any kind of accumulation of um, tau or hypertabulin. So it's basically the kind of necessary condition to develop Alzheimer's, but by itself, it doesn't predict actually when somebody is going to get Alzheimer's and how fast somebody is going to progress. In contrast, when we add tau on top of it, tau is a very strong predictor of 
impulse hat metabolism, so basically a functional impairment of neurons, very less neural activity. And this reduction in neural activity is actually the one which is driving primarily the clinical symptoms. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So by that, I would give you some time to question because now we come to a second block on uh, psychiatry. But now can you say something about then the, the molecular biology of that? So, so how should we think about it? Because now we have the correlation, yeah. right? Okay, so my, my molecular biology is, okay, first of all, not quite my um, most strong field, but in general, like from by molecular biology, what we know is actually amyloid plaques, for example, they accumulate primarily extracellular. So basically it's a kind of like, uh, people consider them now in the meanwhile as a kind of garbage plaques. Basically <coughs> all the abnormal amyloid outside of the cells is transported and forms this kind of amyloid plaques. In contrast, what the studies have, what, what we know from so from the histopathologies, that the tau pathology is actually the one which is intracellular. It primarily affects the synapses and synaptic, the axons of the transmission. And if tau is accumulating in the synapses, it starts to disrupt the signal transmission into cells. That's basically a kind of parallel evidence which comes from the last four, five, six years from neurobiology experiments, where they simulate in mice, where they develop the mice models which can accumulate tau or interesting actually, or uh, in vitro cultures of cellular models from Alzheimer's disease patients, and show actually that the tau species are actually really dis disrupting the neural function from inside. So that means that there is some generator of, let's say, you use the word garbage, so let's reuse it. There's a generator and then this, this garbage generator, its echo is an amyloid plaques, possibly. And that same garbage generator might be the driver of tau. Uh, or do you see it really as the amyloid plaques driving, causing we, we, also we, tau build let, up? Let's say like this, we know that if amyloid is not there, that's what we you know from tau will not cause anything. Mm -hmm. So it's not really garbage in the sense, it's kind of, I, I, I called it necessary condition. So mm -hmm. we know that yeah. the amyloid somehow appears, uh, we know that there are risk, genetic risk factors like APOE, which induce high, basically if one has APOE 44 phenotype, that amyloid is much more likely, it also Alzheimer's pathology is much more likely in those people. But we don't actually know when, why and when amyloid actually really starts to accumulate, but we know that this is a necessary condition, so we cannot take it out of the equation completely. Mm -hmm. We just know that then afterwards it propagates, it accumulates, but it's also animal experiments point to its toxicity, it seems to be, at least from the in vivo human experience, much less toxic than actually the tau. Mm -hmm. And this is kind of recognition comes, I would say, like 10, 15 years too late after a lot of anti amyloid trials failed. There were like roughly 20 to 30 anti amyloid trials which were ongoing in the last 15 years, which all of them failed. Mm -hmm. And again, this tau evidence is generated only in the last four or five years. And mm -hmm. now, uh, for now, the most successful candidate is obviously the anti tau treatment. But it's kind of tough because they really need uh, need to reach a much more uh, deeper goal of going intracellular mm -hmm. rather than extracellular. So right. we can remove amyloid. We don't yet know if we can really remove tau. Mm -hmm. in ages. But and then now you have a link from tau to hypometabolism. Mm -hmm. So what's the causal step there? The, 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 the causal step actually is fairly simple. Tau is primarily accumulating in the axons, which transmits a signal from mm -hmm. one neuron to other. And as soon as this is the five, five tau tangles become too a lot, or just misfolded, they start to disrupt the membranes of the axons. Okay. And mm -hmm. basically, the signal transmission doesn't work as effectively. Mm -hmm. That means basically that's why hypermetabolism right. occurs. So the neuron mm -hmm. still lives, but it cannot really effectively yeah. transmit. So these tangles cells. are inside the axon, or they yes. start to affect the swan cells? No, they're inside the axon. Okay. Inside the axon. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Question? So this increasing tau concentration. Uh, increase in tau concentrations, are they because of some um, un underlying bi uh, biochemistry that is undesirable, or is it that uh, that the mechanism of uh, of uh, 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 sort of eradicating the excess tau, that's the one that's affected? Wh which one? I, I guess if you answer the question, you get the Nobel Prize. Um, <laughs> okay! <laughs> okay. <laughs> so basically, we know that tau is toxic. We know that it accumulates. But, but is it toxic? Because uh, it has folded uh, in some way, or it is toxic right from the beginning? It's toxic. Uh, no, is, there is normal tau. There is a lot of normal tau in exons. Okay. Absolute normal tau. We are told that there, at some point <coughs> there is a misfolding which occurs in tau. There okay. are kind of like mutations of this tau occurring in some people which are not occurring in other people. And these mutations, they are misfolded. They have a different protein structure which cannot integrate into the normal workflow of the exon functioning. 
and that uh, tau is actually kind of toxic. So okay, so there's a very specific configuration of uh, the folded uh, tau, and that's the one that's exactly. Okay. There's a kind of like several types of isoforms of the tau which are toxic, and this only when they occur. So basically, basically when these mutations are kind of occur, uh, then this amyloid then this kind of Alzheimer's disease is cascade is triggered in the sense. I see. Okay. Yeah, it's the it's the phosphorylation of tau. So tau is a protein that sits on the microtubule, uh, and it does its job. It's important, but the, somehow it gets phosphorylated, and then to the microtubule, mm -hmm. has a, then then becomes problematic. The axon has a structural problem. But this phosphorylation, if you look at hibernating animals, they manage to phosphorylate their tau when they hibernate, and then dephosphorylate their tau when they come out of hibernation, and their brain is fine. Mm. So uh, there's, there may be some uh, some normal biochemical process uh, that goes wrong in us. Okay. But that dephosphorylation unfolds the tau? And it goes back to normal. Okay. Yeah. So people are studying this actually. But when it phosphorylates, that's when you get the tangle build up, because the, 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 it's not only the, the phosphorylation, right? The, yeah, you you start to build these the, tangles then. Yeah, they call them neurofibrillary tangles yeah. once it's phosphorylated. Yeah. Right. But they, because of this change in the folding, they they start to become attracted to each other or something. That's an, and they accumulate. And that's how you get the accumulation. We don't know if the accumulation is actually a point of attraction. It could be also kind of like a trial of the defense mechanism. Uh, they're basically like amyloid. The mm -hmm. that they are put together to be less less toxic. Okay. We don't know. I, I mean, there are, there are few studies that I'm aware of which show how that accumulation, or how this accumulation process can work. But if it's a protective mechanism or a kind of right. like a disease mechanism, it's not really known. Okay. Do you know if these two processes start? Um, if what? Do you know if in humans these two processes, tau and amyloid plaques? start at different age, at different time uh, uh, in our development? Uh, kind of, depending on what kind of tall species one looks like. Uh, so we know that first, <laughs> actually, because mm -hmm. that we know from his pathology studies from Bragg, mm -hmm. from the Bragg studies. <coughs> so actually, the initial mechanism, like, if I would have shown the same slide five, mm -hmm. 10 years ago, maybe, mm -hmm. the initial was very clear. Amyloid comes first. Mm -hmm. Amyloid is there. Some people have it at the age of 20, 30, 40, mm -hmm. and then like 15, 20, 30 years later, tau comes into play. Okay. Uh, now it seems actually that basically there are, at least uh, since we have uh, quite, uh, quite sensitive CSF assays, to serve those kind of fluid, fluid mm -hmm. assays to detect this tau species, it seems that some of this kind of pathological tau starts at least kind of similar to the amyloid depositions. Also, there are uh, some uh, one brass study which analyzed, which also shows that there's kind of tau itself. Can be this pathological tau actually can even be itself present in the brains of healthy individuals, um, but of course in far far lower quantities. Sense. <coughs> so basically, uh, the question is, do they seem at least based on the current knowledge to co-occur more or less simultaneously? Some might go earlier or later, but it's not like very strict uh, dimensional. So based on the current knowledge, any one of us here could take a test and have a prediction of whether we're getting Alzheimer's. Uh, based on the current knowledge, um, for example, for example, if you uh, yes, in some specific conditions, okay. I would say uh, you can test take a genetic test if you get a uh, positive, um, pre for for homozygous basically, you can pretty much say that if you live, live long enough, you are very likely to get Alzheimer's disease. That's a most pr predictive causal factor uh, in that sense. Um, in terms of amyloid and tau, it's much, much less because uh, in healthy individuals, yes, you may be amyloid positive, but about 20% of all the population are amyloid positive and never get Alzheimer's disease, for example. Mm -hmm. So it actually seems to be, you need to get both amyloid and tau. But when amyloid, if you have amyloid, if you will develop tau, it's not very clear. Uh, mm -hmm. So who is developing or not? There are a lot of computative mechanisms like stress, oxidative stress. Uh, blood brain barrier damage, which are discussed in the topic, sleep deprivation, a lot of basically. What about environmental stressors? Sleep, sleep deprivation. Sleep so environmental, uh, which seems to be kind of like um, uh, where mm -hmm. some few studies, very small sample sizes, actually show that they may promote accumulated accumulation of tau and blood. But again, they are very preliminary and very small. So. Okay.
So, okay, good. That was kind of like an illustration of how this kind of multimodal neuroimaging can help us to address uh, neurological or neurodegenerative disease understanding. So, so what cannot be done basically through a pure kind of like animal experiment or ex vivo studies and so on. Let's go now to a study which we've recently published, which is basically uh, an I speak as an illustrative concept of what can neuroimaging tell us about autism spectrum disorder. And here the story is a bit more, much more complex. Uh, autism in itself is very heterogeneous, and there are kind of both on the diagnostic level as well as the biomarker level, there are no real biomarkers available. And the heterogeneity, heterogeneity of the diagnostic criteria is also kind of like not very helpful. So basically, they can find autistic individuals which, which look very, very different to each other and still have the same diagnosis. And um, the kind of like trigger for that study, which we conducted, like we published this, this year, was a um, mess of the literature which we observed when we would try, when I was for working still in a pharmaceutical company, uh, we were looking for some kind of biomarkers. What can we use as a biomarker, potentially for treatment or something like that, in, for autism spectrum disorder, to use for our clinical trials. And one of the hits for biomarkers in autism is the so-called resting state functional connectivity, which you heard a lot about today. But when we started to do a kind of like non-systematic review of the literature, it depends on what you look at, we could find any kind of claims for resting state in autism spectrum disorder. There were studies which showed a kind of increased and decreased functional connectivity in Alzheimer's disease in both at the same time. There were studies which showing only decreases or only increases, global increases, local increases, basically any kind of region, any kind of direction, and so on. And the mess was basically partially due to the kind of like a lack of established methodology of that field that basically everybody uses, which is on one side good, but on the other side it's problematic to compare things. Because different diagnostic criteria, different sample sizes, different analytical approach, different processing strategies, different recruitment criteria. Every single that adds or two word variants and may explain why one study finds that phenotype, the other study finds another phenotype. So we said, okay, can we somehow address that question? Is there a phenotype of autism? And is it kind of can we replicate more of this type of phenotype? And so what we did is a very large consortium effort where we collected um, some kind of public data. So called, uh, for example, this I byte one and I byte two. These are two publicly post hoc acquired cohorts of autism of patients and healthy controls, or typically developing controls, meaning like every kind of any researcher who did some kind of study, imaging study in autism could put, can put their data into this public repository of autism. And meanwhile, this public repository one and two ha each has about 500 autistic and 500 typically developing controls. So roughly they're talking about 1,000 patients, 1,000 controls. But of course, a lot of data had to be thrown out because of quality issues, because a lot of data sets have only resting state for four minutes, for three minutes, or extremely high TRs, basically extremely low spatial resolution or temporal resolution, or a lot of, kind of other confounding experiments. So we could only use roughly around three, 300 patient data sets and uh, 400 controls. We had also one single site cohort, so-called in four cohort, where all patients' controls were acquired on the same scanner using the same diagnostic criteria, basically in a single study. That is a pretty small data set, but still it's the most homogeneous data set we have. And another one, which is also coming now from the European uh, initiatives, the so-called IMI initiative, uh, um, which collected a large data set, prospective data set, of autistic patients and health controls using standardized diagnostics, standardized imaging criteria, but in a multi-center setting. And from that data set, we basically could keep up the quality criteria of roughly 200 patients and 200 controls. So we said, okay, now we have all those data sets. Can we use a strict kind of exploration validation strategy? So we said, okay, the biggest, one of the biggest and more homogeneous data set, and the AIMS data set in that case, we take an exploration data set. So we look if we can find some kind of significant differences between ASD and controls in that specific data set. And then we lock our analysis based on that. So whatever we observe here, we strictly try to replicate that in the other three cohorts. So we're using the same processing, the same analysis <coughs> methodology, the same statistical analysis. And to avoid any kind of assumptions to the kind of data, to make the data least processing, because you can get this resting state, you can get it pretty at once. We used one of the most simple connectivity metrics, the so called degrees in trinity. The degrees in trinity, I mentioned it at the beginning of my talk. Is basically we count for each voxel 
in the brain, how many other voxels in the brain are correlated with this voxel above the specific threshold. The threshold was chosen to be a correlation of bigger than 0.25 based on the previous literature. There was basically literature research showing that that is a correlation which kind of like removes most of the noise from the data. Uh, also, that's called spurious correlations. And then basically, if, uh, so this is kind of like fixed criterion. So, and then we count, for example, to that voxel, there are a lot of other voxels which show this kind of correlation above threshold. And that voxel, for example, is only correlated with one other voxel above 0.25. And then the, the more, the higher the degree centrality, the less, the lower the degree centrality. Good? So far? Okay, so we used that approach. And first, of course, when we got our data in the UAMS data set, we looked from the computer all the correlation coefficients. We looked what happens if we just plot, plot the histogram of correlations, what is, and how the controls. So basically, so basically, all the voxelized correlations we observed across the whole data set, average across ASD, or average across all the controls, and we just computed, plot it as a histogram for controls for ASD. What we see is actually that the distribution of correlation coefficients is, is pretty much identical. So there is absolutely no difference. So there are equal num num numbers of strong correlations, of negative correlations, of zero correlations between ASD and controls. If one just looks over the brain, being completely non-specific, just kind of like counting the number of correlations. However, when we look at in a kind of like spatially refined pattern, so we compare each voxel between ASD and controls by itself, and apply kind of like uh, corrections for multiple comparisons, we get a slightly different picture. We get a cluster uh, here depicted in kind of orange-red, where ASD have increased in degree centrality relative to health controls. This is also called pro proto parietal network. So basically, where the de degree centrality, and in parallel, we get another network, the sensory motor, going into temporal regions, where degree centrality is lowered than in patients as compared to significantly lowered in patients as compared to health controls. So to give you an illustration, because those kind of maps look always nice, how the real data look like, and you see basically the distributions of real data, we also compute the so-called effect sizes, called D. The effect sizes are like moderate to strong effects, uh, mid-range to strong effects, but you see that the distribution overlaps quite a lot. So it means, okay, there is a significant, clearly significant difference uh, between patients and controls on the group level, but that difference is fairly, on a kind of like on a single subject level, it's not really useful. In the sense that I cannot say basically that, that subject is a subject in ASD or controls because uh, the, the distributions overlap. But that was not our question. Our question was in the first place: Can we now replicate it in the other three cohorts? And then we try to do it. Basically, we take this mass here now for increase and for decrease, extract the mean signal for each subject of the other three replication cohort, and just run the t-test. Quite simple. We have a direct, even a direct hypothesis because we expect an increase in the red uh, regions and decrease in the blue regions. And what we see is here now in the abide one, and abide two, and in the inform, we see indeed all three cohorts display a significant difference between SD and controls. But now, when looking on these two retrospective cohorts, again keep in mind these data sets are pooled across a variety of researches, different diagnostic criteria, different modality, different sequences, not standardized at all. It's just a kind of like uh, 15 different data sets which were pulled together without taking care of anything. And still, in those data sets, we see a minor like effect size of cones D of 4.2, which yet reaches significance because we had three to four, 300 people, uh, patients with 300 controls in each of those data sets. However, when we look into the most homogeneous cohort, single site cohort, we see that actually this effect is actually even larger than in our exploration cohort. We reach a cones D of about 1, so we, we get a really now start to get a large effect in the standardized cohort for differentiation between AD and SD and controls. Now looking on the degree centrality decrease in the sensory motor region, uh, the pattern is less convincing. So we still get a significant replication in two out of three cohorts. So basically we can replicate it in about one uh, with a decent effect size. The effect size also in the exploration in the info cohort is fairly large, but in this MI2 cohort, uh, this effect were substantially, or basically zero. There was no differentiation at all. And the only thing we, we tried to explain it using a lot of post hoc analysis, what may drive this lack of effect and so on. The only thing what we uh, see, what is really distinct between ABI2 and the other three cohorts is that this cohort is substantially younger. So they are six to seven years younger than everybody else. So they have much many more kids and adolescents compared to adults, while the other cohorts have 
higher proportion of adults. That was the only thing, uh, there was no convincing link to age actually. So there were some kind of age effects, but not really consistent across cohorts. But that was the only kind of like effect. And nonetheless, it was a kind of encouraging for us at least to see that there is something which commonly emerges across all data sets. But now the cerebellum was left out on purpose? Uh, cerebellum here is just not displayed, but there was nothing significant. Ah, okay, so it was included in the analysis. It was included in the analysis, uh, at least the upper part of the cerebellum, because the lower part of the cerebellum was not covered by all scans okay. in several of the data sets, but basically the upper, the upper half of the cerebellum was included in the analysis, nothing came out of the At least using this method. I know that there are a lot of people who use ICA analysis, mm -hmm. they all show this kind of uh, cerebellum involvement, mm -hmm. and that actually we couldn't at all, uh, using the degrees, we right. didn't see cerebellum at all. So, okay. That is kind of like nice, illustrative, validate exploration, validation, but that basically is just a single number. So do they actually see spatially those patterns of PSD and those control? Are they also similar across patients uh, in different cohorts? Yeah. So here now you see what uh, the unthresholded T maps. So rather than putting us this kind of like arbitrary statistical threshold, we just uh, plotted uh, again uh, the T scores for patients versus controls for all three cohorts. And what we see here is quite nicely is actually this frontal increase in degrees of radity. We see it in all four cohorts, right, right, right after the bar. You also see it here, here, here. Here, and about one, it starts to get less, but it's also seen. And it's kind of the, the center and motor regions here are always extremely blue, basically, that they decrease in patients' relative to controls. is also kind of prominently observed across all for data sets. You can even quantify that in the kind of spatial similarity. You can take those spatial similarity patterns and correlate them to each other to see if basically those profiles are similar. And indeed, we see that all of those spatial profiles, which is in waves and are wide, and have waves and have two and in four, they're all spatially correlated. So meaning that if in one cohort, the region has an increased degree of radiation, it also has a high likelihood to be increased in the other cohort. Suggesting again, just building up more confidence that those effects may be not real uh, differentiation in the control. Okay, as mentioned before, initially we were focusing. Uh, I'm not sure how much uh, how we are doing the time. No, great. Keep on going. Okay, um, that's basically as mentioned before. The Grissom relativity was picked for one reason. It's very simple. So it doesn't give any kind of like. So the simplicity also comes with a problem. Interpretation-wise, it's very difficult to understand. It's kind of like very global summary metric. So we said, okay, now since we get built up confidence that this effect may be real, let's try to dig into this effect further and try to understand of what may be the driver of this degree centrality changes. So what we did is we computed. Now it gets a bit more complicated. Um, you can imagine now what can happen to a distribution of correlation coefficients. Why it may they, it may differ or not? For example. It may be because we have this kind of like within masks and outside masks. So for example, here, this is this red one is where we see an increase in degrees in tragedy, and everything what is green is what is not significant. Here, what is where we see a decrease, a decrease in degrees in tragedy in green is everything what does not survive significant. So basically, inside and outside of regions, we show an increased degrees in tragedy. So this is this W equals within, O outside. So we can now look. If the mean connectivity is changed within those regions, so for example, and we can do it in three different ways. We can compute the mean connectivity from within to within. So we, for example, we take one voxel here in this, in this let's call it pink, from pink to pink. And we can look if this connectivity between voxels within these masks, within this is degree centrality network, is it changed, the mean connectivity. Maybe the mean connectivity outside, so maybe from green to green is changed. Or the alternative is, a, or from pink to green, so from mean from within those networks to outside of those networks. Could it be that the mean connectivity is changing? One, okay, mean is just one possibility. Okay. Correlation gets lower, higher. What can also happen is that the variance gets bigger. So okay, there's a range of connections. Basically, that that means more strong connections, that means more weak connections. Obviously, it's basically that the, vari the variance in ASD gets bigger than the controls within, outside, or from within to outside those networks. So that's pretty straightforward. Now we can go and build up more complex on that. We can say, does the proportion of connected voxels change between SD and controls? So for example, let's assume, for example, just a kind of a, a exemplary. Could it be that in s controls there are 70% of voxels are connected to each other within those networks, and in patients there are only 60% of those voxels which are connected to each other? 
port to outside of this network. So basically, we compute the different metrics of proportion again, from within to, to within, from outside to outside, from within to outside. And last but not least, could it be that neither of the three is actually changing? So the mean is intact, the variance is intact, the proportion is intact, but actually that there is a shift in the distribution. So basically, that for example, connections which are connected to each other in controls inside that network, that they start to connect to be connected to something else in ASD or vice versa. So basically, do we see that connections actually just kind of shift their topography from within to outside or vice versa? Again, as I mentioned, it gets a bit more complicated. Try to stay with me until uh, the results. So, and now we again we extract all these type of metrics, I mean one uh, shifts, and we compare them to our initial degree centrality findings. So, here, for example, in the UAs, these are the effect sizes for the initial degree centrality, where we see an increase in controls and a decrease, uh, uh, so sorry, increase in ASD and a decrease in ASD effect size colon D again. And now we recompute these effect sizes for all those different mean, variance, shifts, proportion, metrics, and so on, and see which of them most closely resemble. And what we see is, for example, here, yes, mean has changed. There is some kind of mean within. Connectivity change is actually insignificant. But for example, for this out soil the increased network, it barely matches the initial effect size we observed. So basically, there is some kind of like mean change in connectivity, but it cannot explain our degree centrality. Same is true for variance. There are some effects which are significant, but they are, from, in terms of magnitude, they are way lower, three times lower, basically, than as compared to our initial finding. And now, when we come to the shift, this kind of proportion five shift, this is this equation here. So just uh, it's a proportion of boxes which are connected to each other outside, as compared to the boxes which start to get reconnected from outside to inside we see actually that we indeed find an actually even larger now effect set as compared to our initial degree centrality finding. And that is true basically that this metric here mimics the degree centrality quite nicely. And when we look how those proportion shifts explain our initial <coughs> degree centrality findings, so basically we just plot them one to one, uh, we see that they're quite nicely correlated with our degree centrality. So that one, so they're basically both the positive and the negative, these proportion shifts are quite nicely explaining what we observed with this initial course metric of degree centrality. And to give you an illustration, so basically what that means, this proportion metric, is for example, let's assume we have a typically developing brain, and there are some kind of, again, some number of connections outside which are connected. So we count here this number of connected voxels, and they're from outside to inside that network, the connection. And now we go to ASD, and what we see is that in ASD, those connections outside get less, and connections from outside to inside the respective networks start to get more prevalent. So these hubs become kind of more central. You can, I mean, the analogy, the most closest analogy would be probably kind of airport analogy. So imagine you have a big hub, like Frankfurt or like Barcelona, whatever. And this big hub is connected a lot of smaller regional airports. And now what happens is in the deep brain, it's not like these connections get lost or something like that, but that those regional airports get more connected to each other what on the cost of Barcelona. So basically, one red network becomes less centralized and other networks becomes more centralized. So again, and that explains actually also this nicely why this correlation structure I've shown initially is quite nicely preserved in autism. So it means that there is no shift in correlation, there is no shift in variance, but just a kind of relocation of resources in terms of connectivity. So are you thinking, so we could think about it like a rich club kind of <laughs> perspective, right? There's this <laughs> there's this densely connected yeah. core and then there's a difference between the peripheral nodes that connect into the core or not. Exactly. Right? This is the, the, the best exactly. Idea. So basically, it's a very nice illustration of the rich club yeah. problem. Exactly. That. The point is just that the rich clubs become less rich and, the, uh, and some other rich clubs emerge. Exactly. Right. Exactly. So yeah. that's something that basically seems to describe the situation we observe best is these competitive controls. Mm -hmm. yeah, yes. yeah. How do you correct the model comparisons in this? Because you have you've introduced yeah. a lot of possible variables that you can test for. Um, in where? Here in the, so, so in the initial? So, the, yeah, so here, so, no, the next the next slide. So here you put in lots of different types of OT yeah. measures. Exactly, and just then, to explain this. Yeah, and then mm -hmm. you have... Um, it's not lots, it's just exactly uh, 3 is 9, 11. Yeah, yes. so you have 11 possibilities. Mm -hmm. And then you have you pre-selected the areas based on a previous analysis. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that 
that also brings its own problems because uh, you're, you're um, they used to call it double dipping in MRIs. Yeah, you, yeah. Have, you select one area based yeah. on one analysis and then dive into that area yes. a bit more to look. Uh, yes and no. It's a kind of double dipping, but it's a double dipping which you do on purpose because the double dipping in that case comes, okay, first we only wanted to know is this effect real or not. Mm. That's the kind of like exploration really validation. Here, I accept now to say, okay, I accept now this effect is real. I'm just looking now for the metric, submetric or the kind of metric, which best explains this effect. So I'm not surprised that, of course, many of them are now significant because they are double dipped in the sense. It just, I just like look now which of them is the most significant, which of them best explains it. So I'm not saying, okay, I'm now surprised, okay, this is mean inquiry. Yes, I would expect that although some of these metrics need to be shifted now because the degree centrality is significant. Obviously, if I derive something from that, it will also be somehow significant. I just look which of those kind of now best most closely reflects my own finding. So but if you took, say, two other uh, brain networks, as opposed yes. to the, the ones that you have, so mm -hmm. you have two networks and you looked at this, uh -huh. if you randomly chose two brain networks and, or randomly chose a series of paired networks, mm -hmm. what would these uh, plots look like? Do you do the same thing? Oh, uh, if you, so if Taking, I don't know, instead of motor cortex yeah. versus the rest, so you took visual cortex versus the rest mm -hmm. to see whether you had a similar change in these parameters of news and signals of time. I mean, keep in mind these parameters here, uh, the effect size is for autism versus controls. Mm -hmm. So um, what I would so expect is basically... My, yeah, so my question is how, how much of this is explained just by chance because you've done a lot of tests. Uh, no, the, the ch so basically, okay, first of all, is the, the first question is by chance, is how likely is this degree centrality finding is a chance of finding or not? That one we can say pretty much low because we replicated three times. Exactly. Three times. That, yeah, I so, think you so can argue exactly. that. Now, what, uh, the only type of comparison now we do is exactly this 11 comparisons here. So this is 11 tests. So at most we have to correct for this 11 tests, but they're not really independent because they are based on the same data within the same cohort and just comparing the same individuals. So now the question is, how likely is that this metric performs better than any other metric? So that's the ultimate question. That's what basically we will be compared. Well, there is unfortunately no real way of computing significance between effect sizes. Uh, definitely there is a way, but it's not very kosher, particularly on dependent data. So what we can only say is, does this metric, will this metric turn out to be still the best explaining degree centrality in another cohort? That we tested, um, um, actually, yes, it is still replicating the same way. The, so basically, the proportion is best explaining uh, the correlation structure between the data because we computed that one also for all the three replication cohorts, and it shows indeed that this proportion is explaining better than the mean, than the variance change, uh, the initial degree centrality finding. So we can only go by replication here. Um, so unfortunately, there is no other way of comparing that. So it's a kind of d double dipping, yes, but it just is double dipping is more of understanding the effect, accepting that this effect exists. Next slide. Um, okay, so um, that's basically also just to illustrate the case. We said, okay, now we have the pathological, not pathological, uh, kind of biomarker, confidence built up that these networks are interchanged in autism. They seem to sh uh, be primarily driven by a shift in connectivity. Is, are they also related to kind of clinical scales in those uh, autism spectrum disorders? And unfortunately here we were quite limited, again, because of the heterogeneity of those populations. We were restricted to only those clinical scales which we have also for replication in the other bigger cohorts. So what we did is basically, again, a similar exploration validation data set. We computed a uh, correlation between our shift connectivity metric and, um, the, and the different clinical scale. So for example, this shifts, we call them hyperconnectivity and hyperconnectivity index. And the hyperconnectivity index was basically the only two significant ones which were observed in UAM's data set were the significant association between the, um, the diagnostic interview communication subscale um, and the hyperconnectivity index and also between the kind of daily living scales in autism spectrum disorder uh, and uh, the same hyperconnectivity index. Everything else is not significantly clinically associated. Just to give you an impression how it looks like, uh, the correlations explained are roughly between three and six percent of variance. So it was not really a striking correlation. What one would want from a clinical biomarker, normally clinical biomarkers, if you really want to use them as a surrogate endpoint, for example, something like that, would need to show a strong correlation to clinics, 
here we see this correlation is rather kind of moderate, which is an important, not the best possible outcome, but an important outcome. And when we try to replicate this relationship in these two other data sets, we could indeed replicate this relationship in the first one. Both of them were significant. Again, we're explaining between 5 and 7% of variance in the FS1, but there were both not significant in the FI2 data set, which, again, the only possible explanation is that it's a much younger data set, a much younger cohort, where this phenotype is not much expressed. But it's a post hoc explanation, so we have no way to test it. So I will skip that part because I think it was already complicated enough. And I hope I could illustrate to you uh, today that this is kind of how neuroimaging methodology, how resting state methodology can be used to further understand the specific underlying pathology, both in the example of Alzheimer's disease as well as autism spectrum disorder, and in particular here for autism, that we see indeed this kind of like a replicable biomarker differentiating between SD and other controls. So I would like then to thank a lot of people who, of course, contributed to this work, and primarily to Alessandro Bertolino, um, who is optional uh, from Italy, uh, Maurizio, and a lot of them basically worked with me together on this autism side. Thank you very much. Fantastic.